Hello, I'm Dr. Ira Nash. Welcome to Well Said. Today, we'll be discussing point of care ultrasound. By using sound waves to investigate the inner workings of many different body systems, ultrasound is a safe and effective tool for helping doctors better understand the condition of their patients. While ultrasound has been around for a long time, recent technological advances have dramatically shrunk the machines used to generate images using ultrasound, which has led to a real shift in how it is used in everyday medical practice. My guest, Dr. John Pellerito, is an expert in the technology and application of ultrasound. Dr. Pellerito is the Vice Chair of Education and Residency Program Director for Northwell Health's Department of Radiology. He's also a professor in the Departments of Radiology and Science Education at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and I'm delighted to welcome him to Well Said. John, welcome. Thank you, Ira. It's good to see you. Thanks for inviting me on the show. So uh, let's start at the very beginning. Um, can you define ultrasound for, for our listeners? Sure. Ultrasound or ultrasonography is a medical imaging technique where we send a stream of ultrasound waves to image different parts of the body. So ultrasound is, but what, what is the energy itself? So these are sound waves? They're, t- tell us a little bit yeah, more sure. about that. Sure. These, these are high-frequency sound waves. The frequency is higher than what we could typically hear with our ears. And it has the ability to transmit into the body and then gets reflected off of the tissues that we're interested in looking at. So the images that we're seeing are kind of the echoes of these sound waves that the machines uh, project into the body. That's correct. So we send in a stream of sound waves at a given frequency, and that frequency is chosen depending on the application. So in other words, if we're interested in looking at the liver, uh, we'll send in a certain frequency of sound waves. They will then be reflected back to the instrument. And when we do ultrasound, we typically will have a handheld device called the transducer. And it's the transducer that sends in the pulse of sound waves into the body. Those sound waves will be reflected from the tissues of interest. They come back to the transducer. And then the ultrasound unit itself will generate an image based on the sound waves that come back from the tissues. And I I mentioned in my intro that this is not a new concept, right? Ultrasound's been around for a long time. How, How long has it actually been around? So ultrasound has been credited as being started back in the 1800s. In fact, it's 1880 where the discovery of ultrasound is credited by Pierre and Jacques Curie. Okay. All right. So they discovered the piezoelectric effect. In other words, the fact that sound waves can generate an electric current when you use certain materials. Okay. And from there, uh, ultrasound was not used for medical purposes until we get to the time of World War II. John, can I stop you for one second? So you said sound waves can generate an electrical current, but I think what you meant was an electrical current can generate sound waves. Is that, did I get that right? Well, it goes both it ways. It goes both ways. It, yes, okay. it does go both ways. So the, the transducer works by creating the sound waves and then it picks up the electrical signal when the sound waves come back. That's correct. Okay. And then it can generate an image based on those returning sound waves. All right. So I interrupted your history lesson. Keep <laughs> That's <going>. quite okay. <laughs> so, you know, it was back in World War II where uh, sonar was invented to, you know, to be used for, you know, interrogating ships and looking at instruments. And from there, it was considered to be useful for medical application. And I believe the first medical use of ultrasound was by Dr. Ian Donald in Scotland, who was an obstetrician gynecologist who Mm. used it to look at babies back in 1950. Yeah, okay. And I suspect that that's how most of our listeners are probably familiar with ultrasound, is the pictures that get taped to the refrigerator of the of the unborn child uh, in in uh, in his or her mother's uh, womb. uh, I want to distinguish ultrasound from some of the other major modalities that radiologists and doctors in general use to image parts of the body. So the other ones that we're, I guess our listeners would be most familiar with are x-rays or CAT scans and MRI machines. What's the fundamental distinction there between uh, 
say, x-rays and, and ultrasound? Yes, they are very different instruments. As you mentioned at the outset, you know, ultrasound is extremely safe. X-rays and CT scans g generate ionizing radiation, which can have an impact on the human body. Uh, so we try to avoid x-rays and CT scans unless they're medically necessary. Ultrasound is, is considered safe in that it doesn't generate that kind of radiation. It won't have that impact on the cells of the body. So it is safe for babies, safe for women, safe for all patients as long as they have a medically necessary application for the study. It, is there any uh, safety risk at all with the use of ultrasound? You know, in, in the laboratory, you know, Ultrasound, when it's used at high intensity over prolonged periods of time, can cause heating of tissue and can cause mechanical vibrations of tissue. But in our, with our current instruments, those levels are... Oh, well, we could probably pause that because I don't want that long pause. It's okay. Just, yeah, just keep, keep going and then we'll okay, edit it. Okay, fine. So current... Ultrasound instruments uh, have limits on the type of ultrasound em energy that can be given to the patients so that we never approach those thresholds where he heating and cavitation can occur. So in other words, theoretically, there could be a problem, but in practical application, ultrasound is, is safe as far as we know. That's correct. Uh, we consider it safe and effective for looking at all different parts of the body. But with all of our imaging studies, we always consider that there should be a, a real uh, medical necessity for doing these types of tests. Well, sure, right. I mean, I think that's just good medical practice. You don't want to do a test unless there's a reason to do it. And the reason I say that is that, you know, there has been uh, interest over the past years for lay people to buy ultrasound instruments, you know, to look at their unborn babies and to, you know, almost to be used uh, for fun and for entertainment. And so, you know, we, cer we certainly don't encourage that kind of but application. I gotta, gotta say, I haven't heard of ultrasound for fun and entertainment, but I, I guess... Oh, I, Tom Cruise, he, he, he was very famous. He was one of the, one of the celebrities that was buying ultrasound instruments. Really? Yeah. For, okay. All right. Learn something new every day. <laughs> so, um, so if ultrasound is safe uh, and we have some concerns about the use of x-rays and CT scans, which carry or the risk of, of radiation exposure, um, why don't we just use ultrasound for everything? Well, it does have some limitations. Um, you know, some of the things that we've learned o over the few years that ultrasound has limited application at looking at certain tissues. It, it does not penetrate bones, so it's not the best test to look for bone abnormalities. It also has limitations in the chest in that air blocks the transmission of ultrasound waves. So there are certain areas where it works really well. Again, when we talk about obstetric and gynecologic applications or looking at the heart, as you very well understand, yeah. you know, ultrasound is a superior imaging technique. But when we're talking about, you know, certain tissues like bone and ear, it doesn't work so well. So you mentioned uh, obstetrical ultrasound. Uh, obviously, uh, in my field in cardiology, we do a lot of uh, ultrasound examinations of the heart, which we refer to as echocardiography. What are some of the other major applications of, of ultrasound? So as I mentioned, you know, we use ultrasound in all different parts of the body. Um, you know, we started talking about obstetrics and gynecology, looking at, you know, uh, the health of the baby in the womb. We can see that uh, we can identify congenital uh, defects, making sure everything is going well. In gynecology, we can look at the uterus and the ovaries. We can look for uterine fibroids or ovarian cysts. Uh, you mentioned echocardiography in the abdomen. It's commonly used to look for gallstones, look for renal stones, obstruction of the kidneys, abnormalities with the bladder or the prostate gland. In the mus in musculoskeletal applications, we can look at tendons, muscles, um, and 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 different abnormalities related to that system. In the vascular system, we use it all the time to look for problems like abdominal aortic aneurysms, blood clots, uh, blockages in the carotid arteries. Uh, we, look at, we think it's great for looking at pediatric patients, again, because there's no ionizing no radiation, radiation, no risk. So, and, you know, and, and because you know, the pediatric patients are the right size for ultrasound, we have really good penetration there. Um, other applications, certainly in, in 
guidance for procedures. If you want to place a, an IV or you want to make sure that a tube is, is in the correct place, ultrasound is really ideal for those applications. And is the technology essentially the same across all of those applications? I mean, it's a, is, is the, do, do you need like a, an obstetrical machine and a liver machine and a, you know, a gallbladder machine, or is it all kind of the same stuff? Well, it is kind of all of the same stuff. I think the real difference when we're looking at these different applications is the, the transducer that we use. Uh, these days, these machines come with different probes, and the difference between these probes is that they'll send out different energies or different frequencies. And so what we've learned is that certain tissues respond better or give, give off better imaging when we use different frequencies for imaging. So for example, if we're going to look at small parts such as the breast or the thyroid gland, we're going to use a probe that gives off sound waves at a higher frequency. If we're looking at the liver or we're looking at the spleen or the kidneys, then we're going to go with a transducer that gives a lower frequency set of sound waves. So these things are kind of tuned for the application that you're using it for. Well said. <laughs> oh, I love it when people say that. Um, so, I, you know, I mentioned in the intro that the technology is dramatically shrinking the size, and I, and I think You'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine the cost also of ultrasound machines. And I, I remember when I was training to be a cardiologist in the late 1980s, which is starting to sound like a long time ago, <laughs> the, the, ultrasounds we use, the ultrasound machines that we used to do the echocardiograms of people's hearts were these big, heavy things. They were like the size of a washing machine that we were pushing around the hospital on these big, heavy, wheeled uh, cards and they cost a fortune. They would cost like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so describe what the ultrasound machine of 2023 looks like. Well, they come in all shapes and sizes. You know, I share those memories as well. When I was training, you know, they were the size of washing machines and they did cost upwards of a quarter of a million dollars. And nowadays, as you can see, I, I brought a prop for Ira to look at. You know, nowadays the, the transducers can house the entire instrument um, and they can fit into your pocket. And, we, you know, we can now use our phones as monitors to look look at the display of the ultrasound images that we can obtain at the bedside. Okay, so let me just uh, re restate that for our, for our listeners. So what used to be the size of a, of a washing machine is now something that I am holding in my hand that, that looks the size, I don't know. A, of, a bar of soap? A bar of soap. And, uh, and you're saying all I have to do is plug this into my, my iPad and I have an ultrasound machine. Or your iPhone? Yeah. Wow. And what, is, uh, what does something like this cost? Well, the, the price certainly, as you suggested, has come down significantly from the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we had to spend back into the, in the day. So now, you know, the price ranges from $1,000 and, and up, depending on the quality of the instrument. And the quality varies significantly depending on the price. Right. Okay. So you get what you pay for. Yes, indeed. Okay. Um, so, uh, so tell me what is meant by point of care ultrasound. So point of care ultrasound is the use of ultrasound at the bedside or, uh, at the point of care where you see the patient. So in other words, if you're seeing a patient in the emergency room, if you're seeing a patient at the bedside in the critical care unit, you can bring this compact instrument right to the patient's bedside and answer the, qu the, the clinical question immediately. So that is the great benefit. It's the portability, it's the, it's the size, and the fact that you can answer clinical questions in, in moments by, by doing a quick ultrasound examination. So in contrast to what we were talking about before, say doing a, 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 an x-ray or a CAT scan where you'd have to literally transport a patient in a hospital bed down to the radiology department and with all the challenges of transporting critically ill patients, you're saying you can bring this handheld device up to the patient's bedside, do a quick exam, and in real time see the images that you're trying to capture and, and interpret those. It really depends on the clinical question. There are some, some, some questions that f doctors and other healthcare providers can answer very readily at the bedside. For example, if there's fluid in the lungs, that's something that a handheld ultrasound device can answer very quickly, or if there's fluid in the belly, or if there's obstruction 
to the kidneys. These, these are questions that we can handle at the bedside. Some more complex questions may require the, the, a patient to go down into the radiology department. And so give our listeners a sense of what the, I guess, the, the current practice is in, in that balance. In other words, uh, is this commonly used in hospitals across the country, uh, in, in emergency departments? Is it only in critical care units? Where is this really starting to uh, have an impact? Well, because of the size of these instruments, they're available everywhere. It really depends on the uh, expertise and the training of the user. You know, there, there are going to be some organizations, some health systems where this uh, training is provided so that uh, physicians, PAs, NPs, other healthcare providers learn how to use the instrument successfully, that they have the appropriate training and credentialing to use uh, ultrasound uh, in an efficient and in, in, in a way that produces the answers that are necessary. Uh, in, 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 in untrained hands, it, it actually can have a detrimental effect. How so? In other words, if the images are not interpreted correctly, then the diagnosis may be made incorrectly. Okay. And do you see this um, displacing more, I'll say, traditional as opposed to old-fashioned, um, uh, things that doctors have used for, for decades? So I'm thinking, you know, I, again, I go back to my own clinical practice as a cardiologist. I listen to people's hearts with a stethoscope. And, and, but I know that a lot more information could be obtained by actually generating images of the heart with an ultrasound machine. So should every cardiologist have one of these things uh, in his or her pocket and, and do a bedside ultrasound exam on everybody, or should we still be listening with our stethoscopes? Again, I think it's a very powerful unit. I think that there's tremendous value in learning how to use it correctly. I think that certainly as a cardiologist interested in looking at the heart directly, it, it really does have uh, tremendous power to, to make these diagnoses. Uh, again, it really goes back to the ability to have the adequate training. You know, there are a number of different articles over the past so many years that have called ultrasound the stethoscope of the future, and indeed it has become so. But again, I think that, you know, as you, as you know from working at the Zucker School of Medicine, we ch start training our medical students with the use and application of ultrasound from day one. Uh, this is something that's not done at most medical schools at this time, but it is increasing across the country. Yeah, tell me more about the, the program at, uh, at the Zucker School of Medicine. Yeah, so we start out day one, you know, teaching our medical student, students the value of ultrasound in learning anatomy, physiology, and physical examination. There are so many advantages to learning uh, with ultrasound because you're getting a three-dimensional aspect of the human body. Rather than looking at images as we did in Gray's Anatomy, you know, our students are now learning ultrasound in real time by not only learning how to use the ultrasound transducer, but also being able to find the organs of interest. You know, each class that we do focuses on a specific body part of, or, or system, and we have faculty working with them, teaching them the hands-on application of ultrasound to learn anatomy and physiology. And in addition, they are learning how to communicate with patients. At the school, we have live models who, who serve uh, to, to not only demonstrate ultrasound, but also give them the, uh, the idea of how to use it clinically and how to develop communication with these patients. So not just the technical skill of putting the transducer in the right place and getting the right image, but the patient's right there and says, so doctor, what do you see? And you're teaching the students how to answer those questions. And that's an in integral part of our program. Yeah. You know, we, we teach them that there is a that there is an application for ultrasound and that they must use it responsibly, judiciously, and always keep the patient first when they do the study. And you mentioned that that's unusual. I mean, the program that we have at, at the Zucker School of Medicine is, is um, 
not widely replicated around the country. Is that is that right? That is true. I would say that nowadays most medical schools have some component of ultrasound training. It may be an elective. It might be a rotation. But Zuck, the Zucker School is probably one of a half dozen medical schools in the country that have a four-year longitudinal program. So we start day one, and it extends through all four years through all of their clinical rotations. So for uh, doctors out in practice now who have not had the benefit of going through a training program like that, how would a doctor in clinical practice uh, acquire the kinds of uh, skills that you're talking about? Well, there's a number of different ways. I think a lot of physicians get on-the-job training nowadays. And again, it depends on your medical specialty. So you, they can learn from other physicians using it in their practice. They can go for courses or symposium. There are a number of different uh, uh, courses nowadays teaching hands-on ultrasound specific to their medical practice. Um, and of course, you know, they can also uh, learn from some of us who work with it very intimately. Yeah. And I want to go back to a little bit of the, the clinical application of this. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that these things are now uh, becoming ubiquitous, right? I mean, you, you can find them, you can take them anywhere and, and uh, use them pretty broadly. Do you see the, the most uh, utility, it's kind of a multiple choice question. Hmm. Um, are we talking about doctors seeing relatively well patients in the office, uh, doctors seeing patients in the emergency room who are coming in with a variety of complaints and we don't really know what's wrong with them, or patients in the hospital at various levels of uh, sickness and, and acuity. Where, where do you think the, the greatest application So lies? utility, uh, ultrasound has utility in all these different venues, right? I mean, certainly, as I mentioned before, we see it all the time being utilized in the emergency department, uh, at the bedside, in, in, in the wards. But it does have application in, in clinical offices. If someone is complaining of back pain, uh, say a nephrologist or urologist can take a look at the kidneys and the bladder. Certainly in your practice, you know, you, if someone is is complaining of chest pain. You could, you could observe the heart, see if there's normal cardiac contractility. You could look at the valves. So it really does depend on the clinical question, but it has a utility across the board. Yeah. Has it uh, found a particular um, niche in, in, um, in the emergency department? For sure. I mean, I, certainly patients coming in uh, in a trauma situation, you know, they can use ultrasound immediately to look to see if there's internal bleeding. They can look to see if there's damage to the internal organs. They can look to make sure that there's adequate blood flow to an extremity. I mean, it, this is something that is used every day in the emergency department. Yeah. Um, you know, as we're talking about the advancing technology of this device um, or this uh, whole system, you know, I, I, I'm reminded of a recent show we did on artificial intelligence in which we touched on a lot of different subjects, but one of them was the machine interpretation of images. And I, I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit and whether artificial intelligence is starting to be used to uh, not only help the doctor get better pictures, but actually tell the doctor what the picture means. Well, as a radiologist, all we talk about is artificial intelligence. I, I know <laughs> you know this. You're all terrified of artificial well, intelligence. Well, no, not, not exactly. I, I think from, from, from the non-radiologist perspective, this is a threat. For us, it's probably the most exciting advancement that's come okay. our way. Tell me why. It really is. Because what it does is it really helps us uh, analyze our images. For example, let's just talk about ultrasound, if, for, you know, for starters. I mean, AI and ultrasound, it helps us improve image quality. It can distinguish noise from real tissue information. So right there, it's very, very helpful. And it also can define borders of tissues. What it can do, it, it, it can give us computer-assisted diagnosis. It can spot abnormalities earlier than the human eye and give us insight as to what we are looking for and a, a further allow us to pursue what the uh, absolute diagnosis is. Um, it, 
it optimizes the image for us. It also automates a lot of it. It does automatic measurements for us, so we don't have to take the time now to mm. figure out what the volume of tissue is. It can, it can give us those measurements. It'll put it in a report for us. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, so there are tremendous advantages to doing so. Uh, AI helps with training. I mean, we have simulators at the medical school so that, you know, when, when a student is learning ultrasound, it will tell the student whether it's actually looking at the organ or not and how to correct um, the the placement of really? the transducer. Move a little to the it left? It does. Really? Yeah, oh, it's wow. really impressive. I wish I had that when I was a fellow. And it, also, <laughs> and it helps with the diagnosis. Um, it also helps with collecting data for research. So, yeah. you know, just like with, with, you know, talking about big data and any specialty, it can collect that for us and help us, again, as it collects more data, it becomes more useful to us in the future. But is it at the point, uh, so let's go back to some of the clinical scenarios that you talked about earlier. Um, is there fluid in the lung? Is there an, a, a clot in a vein? Is there an obstruction in an artery? Are, are the systems good enough to actually generate answers to those kinds of discrete clinical questions? It can if you provide it with the correct information. And that is really key. That goes back to having the training, the expertise to use it properly. You know, I hate to use the expression, but it's true. Garbage in is garbage out. If you don't provide the system with it, with an adequate image, it's not going to be able to interpret it for you. And I think, you know, when you talk about the companies that make these portable units, they would like you to believe that with very little training, you can be an expert. And that's just not the case. Well, they want to sell a lot of units. Exactly. And so I think that, unfortunately, you know, it looks like it's easy to do, but it's really not. It requires years to become an expert. And AI is only as good as the information you put in. And other than the application of artificial intelligence, where do you see the the future of ultrasound going, technologically or, or in terms of clinical applications? You know, we talked about how AI is really changing the face of what we do. But again, I think we're going to see a continuation of miniaturization and portability. I think the price is going to continue to come down. We've already seen changes where we can get images now in 3D and in 4D. We also have applications. 4D? 4D. That's that real-time 3D I examination. So like a 3D movie? Yes. Okay. But, wow. in, but while we're doing the scan. Yeah, okay. So that's pretty, that's pretty exciting. Um, you know, we also see that, uh, you know, we can um, use it at the bedside even more efficient, efficiently than we have before. Um, there are a number of therapeutic applications that we're using it for that you, that you may be aware of. For example, high-frequency ultrasound is now used to treat patients that have fibroid disease, prostate disease, um, and this is, again, a non-invasive way uh, to treat those problems. And then there's a whole other level of, uh, of therapeutics that is coming along using ultrasound contrast. Ultrasound contrast is a great way to visualize blood flow and to characterize tissue, for example, to try to see if someone has a, a tumor in their organ by injecting patients with these little tiny micro bubbles that work as the, like the contrast you would see on a CT scan or an MRI. It, it shows you normal and abnormal enhancement. And we, and we use this all the time now to characterize tissue without having to go to CT and MRI. So the, the contrast you're talking about is just changes the local reflectivity to the sound waves and markedly increasing the reflectivity. We're, we're injecting millions of these tiny particles that are basically just air containing bubbles with a, with a little uh, lipid or fatty shell, which is digested by the body. It's perfectly safe. We can give it to women, we can give it to children and it has absolutely no effects, no side effects, which is really a beautiful thing. And it, it really markedly enhances the visualization of normal and abnormal tissue. And even Above that, we, we now see some companies that are placing therapeutic agents inside these bubbles. For example, clot-busting drugs or chemotherapies so that these bubbles can then be delivered to the tissues where you want the, the medicine to go, disrupt the tissues with the ultrasound wave, and then that medication is delivered exactly where you want it. Oh, and you can watch the whole thing And live. you can watch it in real time. Wow, that's really... It's pretty exciting. That's pretty spectacular. So... Um, uh, thank you for uh, sharing all of this information with us. For, for our listeners who are hungry to get more information 
about this, uh, wh- where would you recommend uh, they go? What what are some high quality sources of information? Well, you know, I think that everyone uses YouTube videos these days. Some you know some of that is may not be the best quality, but I think if if you know if you carefully go through it, you can certainly find uh, some medical uses of ultrasound on YouTube. There's you know very reputable sources include universities that are using it. There are also specialty organizations such as the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine. It's the Intersocietal Accreditation Commission, uh, the Radiological Society of North America, and I'm sure, you know, there are other specialty s- societies in OBGYN, cardiology, emergency medicine that have lots of great sources of material. Okay. Well, John, thanks so much. My pleasure, Ira. Thank you. Uh, my guest has been Dr. John Pellerito. He's the Vice Chair of Education and Residency Program Director for Northwell Health's Department of Radiology. Uh, he's also a professor in the Departments of Radiology and Science Education at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Thanks also to Jared Bassman for researching this topic and to our producer, Connor Pilkington, and our audio engineer, John Mullen. For more information about this program and to find any of our past episodes, please visit our website at medicine.hofstra.edu slash wellsaid. You can also subscribe to our free podcast by searching for Well Said with Dr. Ira Nash wherever you get your podcasts. Our listeners are also welcome to send comments, suggestions, and questions to wellsaid at hofstra.edu. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ira Nash, and that's Well Said.